Hi everyone, this is Candace from Run For Something. Um, I'm gonna give it about another minute before we get started, just to give folks an opportunity to jump on. As you can see, if you wanna introduce yourself in the chat, feel free to do so. Okay, it's 7.02, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And as people continue to jump on, um, we'll let them jump on then. Again, thank you so much um, for joining us tonight. My name is Candace Harris, and I'm the Midwestern Regional Director here at Run for Something. I'm really thrilled to be holding this space for you all tonight. Black women have been the driving force behind democratic politics for generations. We have been a part of so many firsts and Run For Something candidates are a part of that history too. And today's call will focus on how Run For Something can best support you in your run and also talk about some common issues that arise with Black women when we step up to run for office. So the objectives of our call today are to build up our confidence and clarity around our reasons to run and also to prepare you for your run. So we're going to talk about some things that you should be keeping in mind. Um, we also are going to talk about, you know, how to overcome some of the common pitfalls and difficulties that um, occur when Black women step up to run for office and definitely, like I said, have some strategies to walk away from this meeting from so you can um, be prepared. And of course, to empower you to use all the resources at your disposal. We have a lot of resources that we're gonna talk about today on the um, call. You're also gonna get a good bit of resources tomorrow. So we wanna empower you to use all of those and to ask for whatever you need. So just some norms for today. Um, I'm gonna encourage you all to be really active in the chat. I'm gonna have opportunities for questions, discussion questions. I just ask that everyone keep it respectful in the chat. We wanna be able to learn from each other. Um, this training is gonna run about an hour. I'm gonna have opportunities to ask questions throughout. So if you wanna ask your questions in the chat, that's great. Just type question before then so I can make sure that I don't miss it. Um, definitely ask a lot of questions and learn from each other. We probably have folks from all over. See someone from Oregon and someone from Milwaukee already. I'm in Chicago. So you know, have a lot of different folks on the call tonight and we can definitely learn from each other. With that being said, um, thank you, Chloe and Sheila for modeling, um, introducing yourself on the chat. I'd love for everyone on the call to, you know, say their name, where you live, and maybe just a sentence or two about why you joined the call today. So I do want to talk a little bit more about who Run For Something is. Um, just like if y'all want to put in the chat if this is your first time hearing about Run For Something, I'm not sure how everyone found out. I know we sent out a lot of emails. We did some posts on social media, but I don't want to assume anybody actually knows who we are and what we do. So Run For Something is a PAC. We are a PAC that work with um, Democratic candidates. and. We only work with down ballot candidates. So those are those folks running for local office, school board, state house, state senate, county commissioners, city council, district judges, and so on. We also particularly work with 40 and under candidates. We also um, work with folks who are running for the first or second time. And um, again, like I said, we work with those folks running on those down ballot races. So we don't work with folks running on federal campaigns or statewide campaigns. And the reason why we focus on those down ballot races is because we know running more candidates locally <laughs> and um, more candidates locally and um, more often will help build that democratic pipeline for the next um, 30 years. So I do want to address the fact that we might have a good bit of folks on the call who are over 40. And I mentioned that we only work with candidates under 40. 
Um, I definitely want you all to stay on the call. We're going to have a lot of great information. One thing about Run for Something, and particularly this call, is we want this information to be available to all Black women running for office. And we're going to have a specific email that'll give you some next steps. So for those folks who don't fall into the age range that we actually endorse in, we're definitely going to point you towards some of our partners who work with folks of all ages, and you'll get all the resources that we're going to talk about on the campaign. And again, um, more about who Run For Something is, we know that running young, diverse, particularly Black women candidates and exciting progressives, um, running strong grassroots campaigns at every level of government and every community will increase immediate turnout for Democrats up and down the ticket. And in the long term, we'll build the bench for the Democratic Party. So in short, we believe in running great candidates, running them locally and running them everywhere. So I wanted to start off with a quick icebreaker to get you all a little more active in the chat and hear a little bit more about why you're, ex what's the first thing that excited you when you started thinking about running for office? I see um, already someone has put in here while they're interested in running for office. If anybody else wants to join in and talk about what's something that excited them about when they first started thinking about running for office, I'd love to hear that. Awesome, thank you. So um, excited about the changes you can make. Yeah, that's super um, important. I mean, particularly for this space for black women, there's a lot of changes that we, br and um, different perspectives that we bring to the table. So that's an absolutely great reason to be excited about running for office. So now we're gonna talk a little bit more about what it takes to step up and run for office and what, um, and in this section, we want y'all to realize that it's never too early to start building the groundwork for your campaign, especially when it comes to getting yourself into the right mindset, having the right people around you, and starting to build community support and buy-in. So a crucial part of running, especially as a Black woman, is to get into the right mindset. Now, we know that when we step into the arena, things look a little bit differently for us, and we face unique obstacles to garnering the support we need to win. So how we can combat that is to make sure that we are in check and in a good mindset to succeed. So some of you all might have heard about this term, imposter syndrome. And like, it's important to like acknowledge that this exists because it's that's the way we can combat that when it comes to running for office. So even folks like Michelle Obama and um, Viola Davis have talked about the fact that they've combated this. But what's less explored about why imposter syndrome exists in the first place is the role that political establishments and systems play in fostering and exasperating this in Black women. And so we have to question why we feel this way when it, you know, why we feel like, hey, there's these systems that are telling us that we don't belong here. And the reason why I make, I point this out is that I wanna validate that these feelings are real and that there are real forces that are happening all around us that are causing them to manifest. So realizing this will help you combat these feelings because they're very real and they can have very real implications to how you run your race. I specifically wanna talk more about why Run For Something is investing in black women, particularly young black women, because a lot of times black women are told we need all these qualifications, degrees, years of civic experience, while our male can counterparts are not met with this kind of opposition and qualifiers. So part of this call is to break down those barriers because they're only there to make us feel like we aren't worthy when we absolutely are. So we belong here. Black women, we've been doing the work for generations and now it's our time to step into um, step into and transform these systems of power. So let's talk a little bit more about taking up space. So part of the reason we're even holding this event tonight is to create a space for us, um, particularly as Run For Something as an organization to show through our actions that you all deserve to be in this space and that Black women, absolutely, we belong here. So um, 
this, when we're talking about taking up space, we have to, you know, in the great words of Shirley Chisholm, be prepared to bring our own folding chairs to the, to the table. Because a lot of times we might not be asked to be, you know, to run for office or to step into these arenas, but we don't need to wait to be asked. Because again, we are already doing the work. We've been showing up in our communities. We've been showing up for democratic campaigns for generations. And we don't need to necessarily wait to be told to take have a space because sometimes that just does not happen. So do not feel like you have to have to ask be um, you have to ask to run for office. But I also want you to consider that the fact that you have joined this call is us from run for something asking you to run now. So if this is the first time someone's asked you to run for office, count this as someone investing in you and absolutely telling you that you should step up and um, feel supported to run for office. So this call is going to help us dig more into um, the social, political, and financial capital that we need to start um, building so that when you and your community tell you that it's time to run, that you're absolutely ready. And just to build off of the slide that I just talked about, about the fact that we absolutely need to step into this space, is that as, when we ran the statistic back in January, it said that Black women only made up 4.29% of all the state legislators across the country. So that's not even talking about the municipal and local and village level races. So there's a lot of room for us to take up space and to step into these systems of power that we've been working in and to transform them for our communities. And so another thing that Run For Something wants to um, emphasize is that you do not have to do this on your own, nor should you. So we're going to talk about how we build out our support systems. Now, as Black women, having a support system in place will make sure that we can have the type of holistic support that we need to run strong campaigns. Because truth be told, it's not going to be easy. And there will be days where you'll question why you're even doing this. And that's OK. But it's crucial to make sure that you are tapping into those folks around you who are your internal support systems. And we want you to count run for something as one of them. We want to, um, you to be able to communicate what you need and to be able to show up as the best candidate you can be while also maintaining some personal balance and peace. Now, this will be something that is important to master early and will carry you on um, and something, a skill that you will carry through once you're an elected official. So um, how many of you all have heard of a kitchen cabinet? And feel free to jump in in the chat if you've heard of this before. But I want to talk a little bit more about who these folks are and why they're important, particularly for Black women. So your kitchen cabinet is a crucial part of your campaign support system. Your kitchen cabinet is your unofficial board of advisors. So they can often be friends, sometimes family, close political associates. But the main purpose of them is to be a place where you can seek support and trusted counsel in your race, but they are not the same as your staff or your campaign team. Um, they should be made of a group of uh, individuals who bring different perspectives to this figurative table to be a sounding board for you as your campaign develops. And they're often the first folks you turn to when difficult strategic decisions need to be made or decisions that you want a second opinion on. They are really necessary for Black women because this endeavor will be hard. You'll need folks in your corner that are not necessarily paid staff or volunteer staff. And for this reason, it's not too early to start thinking about who these folks will be and what they'll bring to the table. Um, uh, so I see a few things in the chat. Um, I'm going to have a second for questions in just a second. So um, if anybody has any questions, like once I get through these next few slides, I'll definitely have an opportunity for you all to ask any questions. And I already see that a few of us have um, a kitchen cabinet. So let's talk a little bit more about who these folks are. So you have your realists. So just as, um, and this is also these definitions are from our wonderful friends and partners at National Democratic Training Committee because they broke it down in a really simple way and we'll also link the article that I pulled this information from in the follow-up email. So you have your realists. You have a, cam every campaign needs positivity and it needs a dose of reality. So you need someone who will provide that the most objective outlook on the on the state of your campaign and give you a realistic sense of the obstacles your campaign might be facing. 
You'll also want that seasoned campaigner. So someone who actually has previous campaign experience and they can bring a lot to the table. So this person will likely have insights that others might not and might even have some valuable connections to other political cooperatives that'll be helpful in like difficult situations. You'll need your devil's advocate. So that's someone who's not afraid to argue against you because you really do need someone who's gonna have that different perspective because group think or a common mind frame of a group of individuals who work together can be deadly for campaigns. So you wanna make sure that you have someone who's gonna be coming from a different point of view to challenge you on some different perspectives in your campaign. You definitely want a moral supporter because we've mentioned that campaigning is hard. So as the candidate, it's easy to start feeling defeated when things get tough. So you just want that person who's going to be supportive, who's going to give you that well-rounded outlook of, you know, what's going on with the campaign and really help you stay cheerful when times are a little bit tough. And then you want that person who has no campaign experience. And honestly, this person might have some of the most valuable things to say because they're going to be thinking a lot like your voters. They're not necessarily a political person. So they're going to think outside the box and they're going to come from like a realistic point of view. That'll be helpful when you're starting to, you know, discuss different strategies around your campaign. And it'll be good for um, to have them at the table because they'll keep things fresh. And like I said, they'll probably have the closest perspective to your voters who are the folks who matter the most. So another thing um, that we want to talk about when we talk about building our support systems are um, building our early volunteers and supporters. So two things that I often ask um, candidates when they are stepping up to run for office, as I ask them, you know, where were your first, you know, X amount of dollars come from? So like, where were your first 200 or 2000 or however much money that you need to raise for this campaign? Where are those first dollars going to come from? And also, how many folks do you have who are willing to volunteer for you? Now, it's important to start thinking about these things earlier than later, because a lot of of burnout and stress that comes from campaigning happens because folks feel like they're alone in this and you absolutely cannot run this campaign by yourself. So we want you to think of run for something as well as part of this support system, but it is also important to have an idea of who in your community can step up early and often with those initial dollars and volunteer support for your campaign. So as you're building out your campaign, um, and or as you're thinking about running, a lot of you all might be in the space where you're just now thinking about running for office. You should sit down with a piece of paper and write these folks' names out just based off of your personal feelings. Because these should be people that you know when you call, they're going to come. They're going to want to help you. And if you're kind of struggling with this, you know, this kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the first slide. Just take a moment and ask yourself, like, why do I feel like these particular folks won't help me. Like, you know, when we were talking about imposter syndrome, all those things, sometimes we're telling ourselves no, and there's like not a logical reason to be telling ourselves no and to be telling us that we don't have early volunteers and supporters. Because the, the folks that you're going to write down on these lists, these are people that you're already working with. They're folks that you've either built grassroots relationship with, you've organized with them, you've marched with them, and um, you've done community events with them, you know, and if you're struggling to make a list of your first falls and supporters, this is also your time to seek counsel with your kitchen cabinet, because they're going to be that reassuring voice for you to let you know that there are folks in your community that want to work with you and want to support you and are behind you. So next, we're going to talk about in our support systems about tempering our expectations with our families and friends. Because with that being said, it's super important to have clear expectations of what families and friends will or won't be able to help with regarding your campaign. Friends and families can be your strongest supporters, but it is not, it is important to not assume that they will always be your front line of folks without having a conversation with them to align your expectations with yours. This is specifically when we're talking about like close family. Because as a candidate, you might feel that your family should be there to help you with every aspect of your campaign. And that's okay to feel like that. It's okay to want support from those closest to you. But you can also be setting yourself up for a disappointment if you don't set realistic expectations and establish boundaries for the duration of your campaign as how your family and friends will help. So for instance, 
Um, I said it might not be the best idea, but I'm going to say it's not the best idea to hire a spouse or a partner on as campaign manager or another high ranking powerful position in your campaign. Those kind of expectations can easily blur the lines of unrealistic expectations and the capacity of the particular individual in your life because, you know, the, regardless of whether you win the campaign or not, that's going to be a person that's still going to be in your life. So if you have a close family member or friend who would like to be involved with the campaign, be sure to have a conversation with them early and make sure you separate the campaign from personal life as much as possible. And there are also a lot of ways that you can have your family and friends involved in supporting roles around your campaign without necessarily working in your campaign. So for instance, having um, friends and family step up to help with child care support or helping with other household obligations so you can have dedicated campaign time. Um, it's great to have a, a family or friend who are an unbiased sounding board for more frustrating times in the campaign. So if they're not working in the campaign and don't know much about the campaign, it'll be good to be able to just air out your grievances with them. You know, um, and another example is having your um, family members or friends organize other family or members or friends to donate or volunteer. So we all might have that cousin who, when we have a family function, they call everybody and make sure they show up. Maybe that person doesn't volunteer for your campaign, but they might be the person who calls the other family members to ask them to make some phone calls for you or to donate 10 or $15 to your campaign. So you definitely want to think about what your needs are, and you don't have to be afraid to communicate those with family and friends, but you do want to set realistic temperate expectations. And so last, when we talk about building our support system, let's talk about what it looks like to have support from our local Democratic parties. So um, I don't know how many of you all are active in your local Democratic parties, and feel free to, you know, um, put that in the chat if you are. I know in every place there isn't an active like county party or um, city or ward or whatever that looks like for you. But support from your local Democratic Party is extremely helpful when gearing up to run for office. And it's something that Run for Something also encourages our candidates to maintain a relationship with those folks. It can look different um, depending on where you are and depending on how organized your local democratic infrastructure is. But it is important to establish that relationship. You want to get familiar with the politics of your community and especially how candidates are endorsed for different positions every election cycle. Because the reason we want to know who these folks are and know how these infrastructures work is because the local parties exist to endorse and help democratic candidates run and win. So these are folks that you're going to want to ask support from when you get ready to run. So when you understand the infrastructure and you know who the power players are, like, do you know who your precinct committee men is? Do you know who your local committee person is? Or however your democratic party or club are set up in the area. Are you a young person who could possibly be a member of a young democratic um, organization? You want to start making those relationships now because it'll be easier for you to come to them and ask for their support or get into their endorsement process when you get ready to run for office. Another thing that you want to start getting used to is understanding what you need for, for your campaign and getting comfortable and prepared to make hard ask of these organizations so you can get the kind of support that you need for your campaign. So if you know your volunteer operations are light, be prepared to ask them directly to send volunteers to help you run phone banks or canvases for you. If you know that financial support is important, be prepared with a high, medium, and low ask for what you need. You know, and I say that to say is that Every party has different capacity to support individuals, depending on like how your party endorses candidates and the kind of money they give. But you shouldn't be afraid to ask for what you need and negotiate till you at least get something. Because again, these folks exist to support Democratic candidates. So make sure you're utilizing them and being clear with your ask. Because again, you're a member of this organization as well and they want to support folks like yourself. So now I'm gonna pause for a moment for questions. I think we've had a few. Um, okay. 
Okay, so I'm going to speak to this one about your local Democratic Party is entrenched and only supports establishment darlings. Okay, so I think like kind of what you mean by this, Pamela, is that like you have a local Democratic Party that is more machine or like you said, entrenched. Um, I mean, that's honestly, I'm in Chicago. So that's kind of a, a lot of the situation that a lot of younger candidates feel like they're in here. But the only thing that I can um, encourage you to do is build your relate, you know, you want to have relationships with the party, you don't want to just completely disregard the party, because again, sometimes they can be the absolute gatekeepers for some, you know, some really critical support. But you also want to focus on building relationships outside of the party infrastructure. So whatever that might look like, you might have grassroots organizations or independent political organizations or um, other community organizations that support candidates, I would encourage you to build your power there as well, because the more people you have behind you, and like I um, have mentioned, and we're about to go into now about raising money, the more grassroots dollars that you have will just make you a stronger candidate, and you might be able to run without the support of the party if necessary. And so, um, Carmita, you're asking about how to create a platform. Um, that's something that I'm, I actually am not going to go into that much depth about that tonight, but it's something that um, I would say that like it's informed by what the needs are of your community. So it's a combination of what's important to you, but also what's important to your community. And you kind of have to um, that's going to come from the work that you're doing in your community right now, the conversations that you're having with folks. And honestly, it also depends on what you actually step up to run for. Um, like, for instance, if you're running for school board, of course, those platform issues are going to look like things that are tied directly to the duties of the school board. So that's how you can start building those out. But um, at the end, if you have any more questions about that, I'll have an email address that you can, um, if that didn't answer your question directly, you can definitely reach out to us and we'll talk about that more. So now we're going to talk about raising money early and often. So um, a quick discussion question that I'd love for y'all to um, answer in the chat. What are the words or feelings that come to mind when you think about fundraising for your campaign? I know for me, like, I've never fundraised for myself, but even when I'm fundraising with other folks, I'm nervous. Sometimes, okay, I see necessary. Oh, I love that necessary. Okay, Pamela, that's very real. Um, it, it, it can be uncomfortable, it can feel a little bit like begging, but we're gonna talk about how we need to change that mindset. So first, we wanna frame our mindset around, you know, and um, around what it means to actually fundraise for your campaign. Cause your attitude and mindset about fundraising is just important as the tangible skills that you need to raise money. You need to get comfortable with asking people for money and doing call time. Um, and how I like to frame it for candidates, because it, it, it does feel uncomfortable. And honestly, I'd kind of worry if you didn't feel a little bit uncomfortable, like asking folks for stuff, because it's not natural for most of us. But again, you are not asking for the money personally. Like this is not money that is going into your personal bank account. This is money that is being invested in your campaign and your campaign is going to create a vision of a better community. So you're asking folks to invest in this vision that when you win and become an elected official, you're going to be able to give back to your community in the form of policy, in the form of legislating and representing their needs. So again, you just have to frame your mindset around, we're not asking money for ourselves. We're asking folks to invest in your vision and your collective vision for a better future and a better community. So um, another thing that I like to um, frame for folks in our mindset is that don't take away opportunities for people to support you. So don't like, I, I think this was a great tip that I heard, I think on a, like an eMERGE training, but don't tell, don't tell yourself no before you give folks the opportunity to tell you no. So what I mean by that is like, when we're getting ready to get into the mindset of calling some of our friends and family or calling some of our work colleagues or whoever those folks are who are on our list that we're about to talk about how we get to that, 
you don't want to necessarily be telling yourself, oh, they're going to tell me no, because you don't know that. These folks might have been like, well, it's about time. We've been waiting for you to run for office. We'd love to support you. So remember that we have to at least make the ask. We don't want to tell ourselves no and then end up not making the ask or making an easy or an unclear ask because folks are probably more ready than you think to support you. So don't take that opportunity away from them to support you. So I just also want to go over some quick terminology I'm going to mention in, over the next few slides. We're going to talk a little bit about Rolodexing, which is building out your potential list of donors, um, call time, and a fundraising plan. And a fundraising plan is a detailed listing of revenue sources that you'll rely on to hit your fundraising. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about these throughout the next slides. So let's talk about setting your goal. So this is going into when you're starting to build out your fundraising plan you need to know how much your race costs. So when you start thinking about the office that you wanna run for, or maybe you already know what office you wanna run for, you need to actually look up how much folks have raised and spent in the past to run that race. So you can find most of these financial disclosures about how much people raised, um, on your local town election website. Like, so sometimes that looks like your county clerk or your uh, city board of elections, it depends on where you are. Sometimes that can be your secretary of state's website. You can also find some of this information on Ballotpedia. Sometimes Ballotpedia has pretty good information, at least for state legislative um, races on how much folks have raised and, um, and spent and past elections. But this will be an important starting point for you to start thinking about what your budget should look like. Because that financial plan is not only gonna talk about how much money you're gonna spend, but it's gonna talk about how much money you need to raise to actually be able to run at the level that candidates in the past have run in. You also wanna start getting familiar with your local campaign finance rules. And you can look those up on your either state or local election commission site or your secretary of state site. And this is also a great place to ask for help. Um, if you have, sometimes people have people in their kitchen cabinet who are, you know, compliance or a lawyer or something like that. If you have someone around who can kind of navigate this for you, that's great. You don't have to have someone around. You can always give these folks a call. You can call your secretary of state election office. A lot of times they have people on staff to point you to handbooks that they have for candidates that are online. A lot of this information is pretty tangible if you just do your research. But again, if you have questions, this is also a place where Run for Something can help. And another thing that we're going that you want to start thinking about is you need to establish a system early to collect money and track your progress. So one thing that we're going to send after this call is we're going to send you a link to act um, to how to set up an app blue account. We encourage folks to use ActBlue because it's just an easy way for folks to be able to track money as it starts to come in. Um, and we actually have a guide around how to set that up. I would encourage you to start thinking about this early, especially if you're planning to run this year or next year, starting to think about how you're going to collect that money will help you because you're going to have to report all of this at the end of the day as well. So now building your list. So I mentioned this term called Rolodexing earlier. So Rolodexing is kind of an old school term, but it, it means just putting all your information, so all of your contacts, um, your personal contacts into one place, and then you're going to figure out how much you think each of those folks can give you on your campaign. So it's a, it's a process of putting everybody into one place, and that one place is usually a spreadsheet. So there's ways that you can upload your iPhone contacts, your Android contacts, whatever kind of phone into a spreadsheet. So it's got people's name, people's phone number. You can take your Facebook friends, you can take your Google contacts, anybody that you have had contact with, and you're going to put those all into a spreadsheet. And I'm also going to, um, after the call, we're going to send some more um, support on how to actually do this process. But essentially, you're just putting every person from your personal networks to your professional networks into one place, you're going to start organizing them in that spreadsheet. So most of candidates early money comes from friends and families, acquaintances and neighbors. Um, another thing we like to emphasize at Run For Something is that self-funding 
um, is not something that you have to do for your campaign. There are ways to be able to raise the money that you need to be able to run a strong campaign without having to spend your own personal money. Because again, you're asking these folks who are likely going to be the same people who are voting you to invest in this vision of your community and that can be and that's investing in dollars. Um, you also do not have to wait till you're about to get on the ballot to start building this list. So this um, process of putting your contacts into one place, it is never too early to start doing that. Um, ideally, by the time you get ready to run for office, this list is something you've cultivated over time. It's something you continue to add to, you edit, you're talking to these folks, you're keeping up with them, however that looks like. You might not be asking for money, but I know I, a good example of some folks that I've seen work their list over this past year is they've called through their contacts in their phone and asked folks how they're doing during this pandemic. It was a perfect way to one, keep contact with folks. But I also know that these particular people are most likely going to call me in the future when they get ready to run for office again. But they've been establishing that contact and they've been building and maintaining that list because you're going to continue to expand this list. And just a quick note about mining your networks. Do not leave stones unturned. Are there organizations that you're involved with that like, for instance, are civic organizations, a perfect example of sororities? I, I, I know I'm an AKA, like put your sorority sisters on that list. Those are the folks that are in your support network. So mine your networks, put them in your list and be prepared to ask them to support you. They know you, they've worked with you. And again, they are probably more than likely wanting to support you in your run. And so now, We've been talking a little bit about building that list. Now we're gonna talk about working that list and getting more comfortable with asking people for money and doing call time. So call time is just dedicated time that you set aside on your calendar, you lock it in and you literally get on your phone, let, you know, ideally your phone's on do not disturb or something. So you're just really dedicated to calling through however many people you've decided to call through that day and asking them to support your campaign in a form of an actual number, whatever that number may be. And I put that call time as sacred because again, this a lot of times for first time candidates is uncomfortable. They do not want to do call time. They are wanting to not put everything else on their schedule besides call time, but it, you have to look at it like it is a locked in sacred part of your time. And it's something that if you have a campaign staffer, they will understand that as well. It's something that when I'm working with candidates, if they if I schedule a call with them and it's in the middle of their call time, I am perfectly okay. And I encourage them to cancel that because call time absolutely does not need to be knocked, especially in the early stages of your campaign when raising that money is very important because a lot of times people establish viability and competitiveness in their campaigns by being able to show that they can build um, that they can raise money. And sometimes it's not even about the amount, it's the amount of individual donors that you're building as well. So you only can get to that money by being by calling folks in your list and prioritizing that time to be able to call those folks. Another thing that you need to get comfortable with is what we call a hard ask. So that's that part of the call um, because all these calls kind of have a little format. And again, I'm, we're going to be sending some support after this call to be able to talk to um, give you a training on what making a hard ass looks like. But the point that I want to emphasize now is that it's something that you're going to have to practice because there's a formula to how you ask folks for money in a way that they're wanting to reciprocate. And you're going to need to practice it because again, this is not necessarily something that comes naturally to folks, but it's definitely something you need to get comfortable with because when you're an elected official, you're gonna be making hard ask of folks to support your um, bill that's about to go on the floor. It's So this is just a skill that is going to be transferable to a lot of different places. And if you need some support around your call time or practicing your ass, this is also a perfect time to ask a campaign staff member or a kitchen cabinet member to sit down with you during your call time and just be some moral support, to be there to kind of encourage you to, um, you know, be confident in your ask. And another thing that I want to point out is specifically because, you know, um, a lot of the stuff I've been talking about are like tried and true um, 
tactics of raising money. Call time, it works. But as Black women and particularly working in our communities and asking for money in our communities, I also encourage us to be creative in the way that we raise money that really um, fits our community. So again, call time works, but there's other ways for you to be able to raise money. Just be aware of the rules um, around how different things that you can do to raise money. Like, so generally in your campaign finance guidelines, there might be some things that you can and can't do when it comes to raising money. So you do want to be aware of those. But I encourage you to think of fun fundraisers, events, you know, campaign swag, for example, not necessarily always giving it away, but maybe selling it or however it is within the parameters of the campaign finance laws in your local community. So again, always defer to those, but be creative. You don't, you, you want to use call time as a foundation of your early fundraising, but you also can use all these other creative things that we've probably used in other um, realms of our life to raise money and build support. So um, I'm going to pause for a moment to see if we have any questions. Okay, so Callie is asking about, is there a website where you can read up more about what different general positions are and what those positions entail? It's hard to know where to start and what to run for. Okay, so that's a great question. Um, so we actually have a website that you can go to that um, I'm going to type it into the chat right now that will um, you can type in your address and you can look up any election any um, office that's open in 2021 right now we only have the 2021 offices available um, to see what's up of up for election once you see the, um, in the place that you run because you know everything is based on like where you live and if you're eligible to run in different areas um i'd encourage you after you see that to just google like what they do like for instance because i'll be honest some of this stuff isn't all in one place i also think ballotpedia is one of my favorite websites like ballotpedia like Wik i'll spell it out um, if you just Google that, they have a lot of information. They don't have everything, especially when it gets to like the super local races, but a lot of times they have information on different offices, what they do when they were up for election in different areas. And it's just a good way for you to start understanding this because um, a lot of board of elections don't always have this information. You have to go to different places to look for it. So like, I think the first thing is seeing what's up for office. Thank you for dropping that. Um, so there's the actual live link that you can go through. I think um, one of the things is um, knowing what offices are actually up for election in what years, and then maybe going to those particular elected officials websites. Like for instance, if you know city council is up for one year, go to the city council's website and look and see the duties and what they do. That's also another place to look. That's a really good question. Okay. So now um, we're going to head into the home stretch and talk about what it's like to maintain your campaign work life balance. So you're not only running your campaign, but you have to continue to run your life as well. And we will help you figure this out. A lot of times what I'm talking about with first and second time candidates really is based around like maintaining work life balance. So one important thing as a candidate is to understand that you have a lot of responsibilities and obligations that you as the candidate can do the best. So you have to learn how to delegate other tasks to other folks, either in your volunteers or in your staff. So you, the candidate, can focus on the two things that you do the best. And the two things that candidates do the best are talking to voters about why they should vote for them and raising money. You're always going to make the best ask. And those should be the priorities when you're thinking about, is this something that in the last week of my campaign, or is this something right now while I'm trying to establish my credibility that I need to be spending my time doing? Because if it's something that someone else can do, then you want to think about delegating that task off. And this is when you start, you know, 
reaching out to your kitchen cabinet or reaching out to your campaign staff or your volunteers. So, you know, um, and one thing to emphasize is like every political campaign ends on election day. Um, time is a very valued resource. So when it comes to delegating responsibilities, we're always trying to prioritize what the most important things are for you as a candidate. And you have to, um, you have to be able to talk to enough voters and raise enough money to be able to achieve your vote goal. Um, this is also something important for your campaign manager to know as well and to understand as well, because they're all because if you do have a campaign manager, they're ultimately going to be the person who is ensuring that you are in fact prioritizing your time and prioritizing your responsibilities to make sure that you're focusing on making those asks to raise money and um, making those asks when talking to voters. And also, if you have a campaign manager, a lot of times they will be the actual person who is delegating those tasks to staff, not you. Um, especially if you've hired a campaign manager, they need to be that person who is doing the delegation. They're actually the person who are managing you. And that goes to my next point is allow yourself to be managed. Now, let me um, explain a little bit more about what I mean by that. Um, Especially, this is particularly for folks who will have a campaign manager. Um, your campaign manager is going to have their job is to have a you know an umbrella view of everything that's going on in the campaign, and particularly when it comes to your time and where you need to be as the candidate, because you have to focus on being the can being the candidate. And being the candidate is like honestly an important part of that is main is conserving your energy so you can show up and talk to voters and have enthusiasm and continue to make those strong ask on calls. So let me give you a great example of how one of my candidates right, running right now allowed herself to be managed by her campaign manager. So we had scheduled a call. Um, the three of us were on the call and the candidate came on the call early. The campaign manager actually didn't want her to be on the call for the first 30 minutes because she wanted her and I to just talk about some more strategic, like minutia of campaign stuff that the candidate really didn't need to be on because the campaign manager was running the show. And so the candidate jumped on a little bit earlier and she told the candidate, she said, hey, I know you've been running around all day and I know you have an event right after this call. So I actually want you to jump off the call, um, take a nap for 30 minutes and come back on at the end and we can talk about some of the stuff, you know, some of the good news that I know you wanna share with Candace and run for something. I could have clapped because one, the candidate was like, cool, I'll be back in 30 minutes. She let herself be managed. And it was so important to allow that because she has a campaign manager there for a reason. And her campaign manager was saying, hey, you don't have to be on everything. You have to actually get some rest and be able to show up for these other events that we have later on tonight where you actually have to speak and show up as the candidate. And I was so proud that like one, the campaign manager was really you know, managing her time like that, but also that my candidate allowed her campaign manager actually do her job. Um, so that's something important to remember. If you are fortunate or to hire a campaign manager, if you have someone who's willing to step up in a volunteer capacity, let them manage you. They're going to help you be able to maintain your energy and honestly your sanity for the duration of the campaign. And so to round this out, let's talk a little bit more about like what it looks like to maintain work life and balance when we're running campaigns. Because the hard truth is that a lot of women, particularly black women, choose, might choose not to run for office for fear of not being able to manage the campaign work with responsibilities outside of campaign life. Um, most run for something candidates have jobs, full time jobs, they don't stop working to be able to campaign full time. Most of our candidates have other obligations, whether those are children or they're in school or they're caretakers of some sort. And especially during the pandemic, a lot of times campaigning, work, home are all generally in one place. And you wanna take this into consideration when you're planning out your run, because we want you all to continue to run now. You can run strong campaigns right now, but you wanna be able to make sure that you create some boundaries and that you respect those boundaries so that you're able to maintain some work-life balance. So what I mean by boundaries are, it is perfectly okay. And I actually encourage candidates to block off some time in your calendar once a week. Um, to just have time for yourself. 
I, I think it is perfectly normal and standard for a candidate to have a block of time, generally a few hours, sometimes that's a Sunday morning, Friday evening, whatever that looks like for them to have time where they communicate to their campaign staff, to their volunteers, to whoever it has some input on their schedule that, hey, this is my time. This is the time that I need to just do whatever I need to do to maintain some balance in my, in my life. And I absolutely encourage you all to do that. You can find time to um, do all the tasks that you need for your campaign and also have time for yourself. Um, a way to make sure that you're utilizing your time is to um, create a daily schedule or a task list of things to make sure you're keeping up with all the important tasks for your campaign and for life. You know, sometimes that looks like you have like an hour by hour schedule and you're literally filling in things where they are. Um, sometimes that might look like, you know, a lot of times in campaigns, they have what they call big rocks. And you say, these are the three things that absolutely need to be done today. And then you have all the little small things that kind of suck your time, but you make sure you get those three things done and you put times next to them. So you just need to be able to prioritize what are the important responsibilities for the campaign and for your life, because we don't want you to feel like you can't continue to have a life while you campaign. It is going to be time consuming to be a candidate, but at the same time, you have to be able to, and you should be able to maintain a balance there. And um, last but not least, you need to build in time for self-care. So if that block and, you know, that block of hours that you have in your calendar, whatever that looks like, whatever self-care looks like, I really encourage you all to be thinking about how to build that in while you're campaigning, because you don't need to sacrifice your peace for this campaign. You want to be able to not necessarily burn yourself out or lose yourself through the um, course of campaigning. So if you start thinking about these things now and really plan out your time and work with your campaign manager or your staff or whoever those folks are that are helping you um, prioritize your time, that's also something that if you're a run for something candidate, I'll help you with and all the other regional directors will help you with. Um, you'll be able to make sure that you can um, enjoy your life while you also campaign because you're gonna have a life after the campaign, whether you win or lose. So I wanna talk a little bit more about what comes next after this call. But before I do that, I'd love to hear um, what's, one of the what's one of the top things that you need support on at this point in your journey. So I know I have a lot of different folks on the call. Some of you might just be starting to think about running for office. Some of you might be in the process of getting on the ballot. What's something that you would need support on at this point? And that can be, okay, a campaign team. Thank you for sharing that, Amani. Um, okay, how to maximize endorsements. Okay, that's something that I can, I'll talk about once we get to questions. Okay, awesome. You all continue to put those in because this is really helpful for us to keep in mind as we think about how we can best support you all. So speaking of that, I wanna talk about some of the resources that Run For Something will have. So I'm about to launch two polls um, to be able to talk to you about some things that Run For Something provides. So um, one of the things that Run For Something provides is we give you the opportunity to talk to a campaign volunteer. So those are folks that work with our candidates. Um, they talk to you all about why you wanna run, you know, what you're running for, kind of help you flesh out your different ideas and thoughts around the campaign. It can be something really helpful at any stage of the campaign process. It's also something that we take into account when we get ready to endorse candidates. So I'm gonna launch that poll right now. If you would like to talk to a Run For Something volunteer, you can click yes, um, and we'll make sure that we connect you with those folks after the call. Another, um, resource that we have too that I'll be that we'll be including in the follow-up email is that we have an extensive network of campaign mentors and those are folks that work with um, candidates even before they're endorsed um, on specific issues on their campaign and so that's something that if they're you know like for instance if you're 
you know, struggling with call time or if you're work, you know, need some help on building out some digital elements of your campaign, because a lot of things are digital right now. Those are things that our that our mentors can help for. So I'm going to go ahead and end this poll. Um, if you have an answer in this poll. Um, okay. Okay. Um, if you've um, if you've already answered the poll, that's great. I'm going to give it like two more seconds because I have another poll that I want to launch about another form of support that we give you all. Yeah, and thank you. If you're not sure you want to talk to a vol, just say yes because it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to talk to someone, just a regular person, about your campaign and you know talk about the ideas that you have. It, it definitely can be helpful in the process. So, okay. So the second poll that I'm going to launch is that we are actually going to create some space for you all to continue this conversation after the call. And um, we're going to do this by creating a group chat for um, anyone who wants to be a part of it. So basically, um, this will just be a chat where you can talk to other candidates, specifically folks on this call, but all of you will be, um, you know, Black women who are thinking about running for office at various stages. Um, the reason why we created this is because we heard from a lot of the candidates that we worked with this year, specifically Black women, that they didn't feel connected to other folks that were running for office. Uh, they felt kind of alone in this process, and you're absolutely not alone, and we want you all to be able to connect with each other. So if you'd like to be added to this group chat, um, I also send instructions on how to do that afterwards, but by clicking yes, that'll um, let us know that we can go ahead and send you that information. So if you haven't um, indicated that you want to join or not, just let us know. Okay, I'm going to give it about two more seconds before I close this poll. And again, if you're not sure, um, you can definitely join and you can also opt out. You can also, you can always leave the chat if you want, but I actually think it'll be something really cool to be able to have organic conversation with other women who are thinking or are in the process of running for office. So, um, and another thing that I wanted to point out as far as resources, um, after the call, we're, I'm going to send you, it's actually going to be a pretty long email, so read it. Um, it'll have some resources about um, starting your campaign, some more information about fundraising, because I know I mentioned a few things on this call tonight that will give you some more in-depth um, information about Rolodexing and building your ask out. We also have a lot of resources on our website. Um, so I'll just drop the link for that here. Um, and you feel, feel free to go ahead and peruse through those, but I'll definitely send some specific ones that I talked about on this call in the follow email. And so um, I also want to talk about the fact that um, we do endorse candidates. Um, I mentioned that at the top of the call. So if you're playing, so after the email, you're going to get a call um, in, um, you're going to get an email, I'm sorry. And in that email, um, we're going to have a link to our endorsement application. Now, this is for folks who are running for office in 2021. So if you are running for office, like you are sure you are doing this, that's, that's how we um, describe it, like meaning that you're either in the process of figuring out how to get on the ballot, you're collecting petition signatures, or you're already on the ballot, like you are actually planning to run, you should definitely apply for our endorsement. So we do rolling endorsements throughout the year. Our um, next in, our next deadline for our May endorsement round is on April 15th. Um, but again, we do these endorsements about every four to six weeks. You're also going to get an email um, about an invitation to our Go Run for Something Slack. So our Slack channel is a place where you can talk to thousands of other folks like yourself who are thinking about running for office. You can find other candidates in your area that are running. We have different channels for different folks, um, people who are planning to run this year or in years in the future. It's really a place where you can just have conversation and also um, see any resources that we share with um, candidates, with prospective candidates. 
And if you opted in to get a, um, to talk to a campaign volunteer, that'll be a separate email that you'll get. Um, that'll tell you the instructions of how to set up a call. And again, you're gonna get a whole bunch of resources from us. So that's all that I have as far as content. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to ask um, any questions that you haven't had answered already. Okay, so I see a question about um, working for the state government and was told that you can't, um, is that some, I, I was told that some state office I cannot hold because it comes from the same payroll. Okay, so um, this question is particular about like working for like a government entity or a state entity and running for office and not being able to do that at the same time. Um, I think that that kind of information is definitely gonna come directly from your employer. Um, I think that would be something that your HR department could answer, particularly if it's about like specific payrolls, but generally this is like a legal thing, like there's laws in place in, in some places where you can't run for certain offices if you work for the actual office, but this is something that you need to get directly from the source. So I would, um, I would inquire like if you don't want to like necessarily if you want to have like a confidential conversation i'd encourage you to go to your human resources department and ask particularly about this and so it can be like in a confidential manner and they'll probably be the people that can best answer or point you to the direction of an answer okay so amani has a few questions um one is should you wait until a long serving elected official retires before running, especially for statewide and national races. Now, um, that's really hard for me to speak to because I'm not, I think it depends on every situation, but in a, as a general answer, no, I don't think you should necessarily feel like you have to wait when you get ready to run for office um, for someone to retire. Um, just in all honesty, some of these people don't, retire. <laughs> they, they literally stay in office as long as they possibly can. And when it comes to running against an incumbent, specifically a long-term incumbent, just some things you want to think about and some things that we also ask when um, we're, um, and when you fill out our endorsement application and you say you're running against an incumbent, you just want to make sure you have a compelling reason to run, like that you can articulate why you're stepping up to challenge this democratic incumbent. Not saying that you shouldn't, you shouldn't like, cause I definitely don't feel like you should not challenge incumbents. Cause a lot of these folks need to be challenged and a lot of them honestly need to be beat. And it might even be time depending on whatever office for someone who is more representative of the community or whatever that situation is to be able to step into that office. But you really will need to think about why you are running for office why you are better positioned to serve and have some specific examples because these are also things voters are going to ask you to especially if it's something someone with a, a long-standing name like you're literally going to be persuading voters and persuading organizations to endorse you over that person so thinking about this early will just help you have a stronger race later Okay, so another question is like, when you're starting it, how do you fundraise and compensate your campaign staff? So um, I talked a little bit in the call about like pulling in early money. A lot of that is just gonna be projecting like based off of your initial list of folks, like how much money people can give you. Um, sometimes you might have endorsements that you're looking to get from like, people like labor unions or whatever or different folks that give money you just need to project out how much money you're going to raise and then you actually need to do it so if you're raising this money by call time if you're setting up meetings with people to be able to ask for their endorsement ask for their support you need to be able to project that out but as far as compensating campaign staff 
Um, it depends on like the level of campaign that you're running. Like if you're running a large election, meaning that like you're going to be raising, you know, a significant amount of money. Like, like for instance, you know, we have a lot of school board candidates that I'm working with this year, and they're not really going to have to raise that much money to be able to run a strong election. There's a big difference between that and if you're running for a citywide election or even a city election in a large city where you're going to literally need tens and thousands of dollars to run. Um, the reason that I mentioned that is because like, you just have to think about who is the central campaign staff. And as you project that money um, and you actually start to bring in that money, you're also, you've created a budget. So you've budgeted those things out. Um, but I think it's important to think about what campaign staff that you actually need at different points of the campaign. Like at the beginning of a campaign, you don't have to hire on a full staff and everybody with a salary. You really need to be thinking about who you need to be hiring at what time. So a lot of times the first person that people hire in like a campaign where they're trying to raise significant money is a finance director. Uh, some like they're like, hey, I need to raise money and let me find someone who's going to help me do that. Sometimes that's a, um, a contractor and sometimes that's a staff or whatever that might look like. A lot of times for really serious campaigns, I'd encourage you to start thinking about a campaign manager because sometimes that campaign manager can do the job of a few different staffers if you find a competent one who um, has the requisite experience. And then, you know, but you're gonna budget that out and you're gonna have to be thinking about your cash flow as well. So um, in a nutshell, I know that's a lot. If you um, need some follow-up on that, um, feel free to reach out to us um, and we can send you some more trainings about that, but it really is based on like your budget, your cash flow, how you're bringing in money and where you budget it to bring in staff in different parts of your campaign. Um, are there campaign models that alleviate, minimize burnout for staff? Um, <laughs> I say that like, I don't know if there's a model, but I definitely think there's a mentality, specifically if you have a campaign manager, like um, just as much as I emphasize work-life balance for the candidate, um, you know, campaign staffers, I think it's important to set, a, to create a, to model it from the top. So like campaign managers, um, a lot of times set the standards for like how they want their staffers to work. Um, I will admit that campaign like culture sometimes encourages people to like work themselves to the bone. But if a campaign manager, I specifically went to a training around like campaign management and it talked about the fact that you just have to create a culture. Like I'll give you a prime example, like at Run For Something, we create a culture where our folks like encourage us to take time when we need it. That can be as simple as a campaign manager encouraging folks to like, if I don't need you to be online till 10 a.m., like don't be online till 10 a.m. And I know it doesn't always work that easy in a campaign, depending on what the particular staff position is. I definitely know it doesn't work that easy, but the campaign manager a lot of times can create that culture and can establish different practices um, to make sure that folks, especially if this is like a long campaign, um, you know, if you've like brought on staff and they're planning to be on for like eight months, nine months plus where you really need them to not burn out, um, it's important to kind of talk to your staff, particular campaign manager about how to create a culture where people don't burn out and quit because that definitely happens. People will quit campaigns before the end of it. Okay, um, India is asking about run for something endorsement process and questionnaire. Okay, so um, our endorsement process basically, um, again, the criteria is you have to be running for the first or second time. You have to be under 40, which for 2021, we're talking about anybody 1980 and after. And you also need to be running for a state or local office. So with the questionnaire, um, Honestly, it asks, um, and like I said, I'll be, we'll be, you'll be getting the link after this call so you can look through it. It just asks um, some top line questions. We do ask about like, you know, are you on the ballot? Because like I said, right now we're only taking 2021 applications. So these are folks that are either in the process of getting on the ballot or on the ballot. We ask about your budget. We ask about like how much money you might have fundraised. 
Um, we ask about your win number, um, which is also something that you can find on the candidate resources website if you're looking for how to find that. We ask you, like, have you calculated that? Have you thought about your um, how you're going to do your voter contact? We also ask a lot about like the issues that are important to you, why you want to run for this particular office. We ask if you're running against an incumbent why you're running against an incumbent. I know a lot of the races this year are nonpartisan races. So folks might not necessarily be challenging a democratic incumbent, what, or whatever that looks like. But if you're running against an incumbent, we definitely ask you to explain why. Um, and just, you know, I think those are like the big things. You So you do want to have an idea of like your budget, your field plan or your voter contact plan and the issues and the reason that you're running. Um, and on the endorsement page, it actually gives you a lot of instructions on things to be thinking about and you and to know if you're if you're at the point where you need to go ahead and fill it out. Also, the kinds of support that comes from the endorsement. OK. Um, so the kinds of support, so I'm a regional director, I'm one of four, we each work directly with the candidates in our region. Um, we give them one on one support. So everything from like, if you're in the process of building out your campaign plan, we'll help you with that. We um, have a, a whole um, guide that we give our candidates that has a lot of different resources from vendors to other partners. But I think the most beneficial thing about a run for something endorsement is the one on one support you get with the regional directors and also the um, the opportunity for amplification of, a, of your race like um, we do a lot of social media and support and amplification of our candidates. We have a podcast. So we like to do, we like to give our candidates different opportunities to like, especially like for local races, to be able to, you know, garner support in different ways. But I think the most beneficial stuff is the one-on-one -on -one support that we give our candidates because we literally will help you in every step of your process of running. And if you don't have something that you need, we will get it to you. Um, in any way that we can or point you in the direction of how you find that answer or how you get that resource. Okay, so Callie, this is um, a great question. Also, India, if, um, if that didn't answer all your questions, we actually do these weekly calls um, that um, you'll get on our email list so you'll be able to sign up for those that go over more in depth what the endorsement process looks like but um that's just in a nutshell so Callie is actually asking a really interesting question about like is there value in just being on the ballot even if you lose once or twice like to build name recognition um I think there's other way to build other ways to build name recognition other than just like literally being on the ballot like if you're going to get on the ballot we want you to run the strongest campaign you can. I do understand that some and, and a lot in and there's some races where it's you know you might be in a place where a Democrat hasn't run in a long time or there's just a lot of things stacked against a particular candidate a lot of times sometimes it's hard for young candidates to run for whatever reason. And we definitely don't tell folks, hey, don't run because you don't think you're gonna win. Like that is not the philosophy that we take here. Um, but at the same time, um, if you're gonna step up to run for office and particularly if you're gonna apply to get endorsed by a run for something, we definitely are gonna help you run the strongest race you can so you can feel like you're not just having your name on the ballot because if people don't know who you are because you haven't done the kind of voter contact that you need to do to be able to know who folks are, they're not going to remember your name was on the ballot because there could be 10 names on the ballot and that's not going to necessarily remember your name if you haven't done any voter contact, even if you lose. So just saying that is like, I think the answer to your question is like, no, I don't think there's just value of being on the ballot, but there is value of stepping up to run even if you know that it's a tough race and running the strongest race you can and having the best voter contact and um, grassroots campaign that you can run to make sure you talk to the most people and have really valuable conversations with them so they actually remember your name, either on the ballot or in the future. Um, 
yeah, there will be a recording. Um, we can, if you would like a, um, a copy of the recording, um, feel free to just email this um, email. We're going to send out an email tomorrow, but I don't think we're going to include the recording with it. But if you want a copy, um, just, you know, let us know and we'll be happy to share. And I think those are all the questions that I have. Oh, okay. Oh, here, actually, I see another question. Um, what resources and endorsements are available to candidates over 40? Um, we're going to be sending you all a separate email that's going to have um, one, all the resources on our website are available to anyone. Um, also, the email will have resources for other partners that we work with. Like there's some partners like Higher Heights, um, Emily's List that work with women. Um, Higher Heights particularly works with black women um, and they don't have an, uh, the same criteria that we have um, as far as age. Um, we're going to send you information about that. But again, all the resources on our website are open. You're welcome to make a mentor request. Um, we, we try to keep these resources open and available to folks. Um, and because we want to, especially, you know, at, from my perspective, I want to support all of you. Um, and the reason, like, we don't necessarily not support folks over 40 because we don't want to. It's just because we have limited resources. And that's and we're really about building the next 30 years of a democratic pipeline. So I don't want y'all to feel like, oh, we just don't want to help. We definitely want to help and we definitely want to point you in the direction of the help and we want you to use the resources. That's why I dropped the website down there. Please go on our website, look at the candidate resources. And again, you'll get a um, email tomorrow that'll be special, that'll be particularly geared to the folks over 40 and the next steps that they can take um, to be able to feel supported in their run. Um, I think those are all the questions. Again, thank you all so much for joining tonight. Um, if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to reach out to us at hello at runforsomething.net. Again, you're going to get an email with a lot of resources and follow up from this call. Um, follow us on social media. Thank you so much for being a really attentive audience. Y'all ask wonderful questions. And again, um, you know, consider this us telling you that you should step up to run for office, that you absolutely deserve to be here, that we are invested in Black women and we want to see more Black women running and winning and leading their campaigns. So thanks again and you all have a good night.